It's not unusual these days to find apologists for religion mentioning logical positivism and implying that the current unpopularity of this philosophy in elite circles spells death for naturalism and thus for atheism. In this video I will demonstrate why this implication is mistaken. I will conclude that the demise of logical positivism does not entail the death of atheism and that there's very little real evidence to support any suggestion that philosophy in general is becoming any less secular. Implications of this kind are pretty familiar to anyone who has sampled the various readers and companions to which William Lane Craig has made a contribution. For instance, in the introduction to his Theistic Critiques of Atheism chapter in the Cambridge Companion to Atheism, Craig states, The collapse of verificationism was undoubtedly the most important philosophical event of the 20th century. Its demise meant a resurgence of metaphysics, along with other traditional problems of philosophy that had been suppressed. Accompanying this resurgence has come something new and altogether unanticipated, a renaissance in Christian philosophy. The face of Anglo-American philosophy has been transformed as a result. Theism is on the rise, atheism on the decline. Atheism, though perhaps still the dominant viewpoint at the American University, is a philosophy in retreat. A passage he seems to have liked so much as to repeat it almost verbatim to break the ice in his and his Biola buddy J.P. Morland's jointly edited Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. Neither our apologist appeals to the demise of logical positivism restricted to conceptually confused Christians, as this infamous doorstepping of P.J. Myers demonstrates. You can see what you Professor do. Myers, you know why that's funny? Because you're assuming that you must have an empirical paradigm to everything that you say, verificationism. It's like logical positivism of the 1960s, it doesn't work anymore. I'll give you an example, because empirism can't even prove logical truths like numbers. What these examples have in common is that they all imply that the collapse of logical positivism somehow entails the collapse of naturalism and thus of atheism. Uh, this implication is bullshit. So, what was logical positivism? And why do contemporary philosophers turn their noses up at it? Well, logical positivism can be thought of as the claim that sensory experience, clarified through the use of formal logic, is necessary for meaning and knowledge. Which is to assert that there is no situation in which we can understand or know what we are on about without our at least having an idea of what sensory experiences and clear logical expressions of them we need in order for what we are on about to be true. The value of this idea was, during the period of its popularity, thought to be its marginalisation of the preceding metaphysics. If logical positivism were true, the traditional metaphysics of the 19th century, which typically consisted in speculations about abstract entities such as rational spirits, could neither be meaningful nor a source of knowledge. This deflationary outcome was particularly popular in the third and fourth decades of the 20th century, because at that time, making the world anew in the light of modern advancement seemed amongst the most noble of enterprises in which mankind could, especially after the tradition-led slaughter of the First World War, be engaged. Indeed, the modernist theme of logical positivism, its fearless use of the latest thing to sweep aside the outdated, can be found in many cultural developments at that time, such as serialism in music, the use of geometry in the visual arts, and behaviourism in psychology. It would be true that logical positivism, as a general claim about verification, is self-defeating. 
The assertion that sensory experience clarified through logic is necessary for all meaning and all knowledge cannot, by its own criteria, be understood or known. It would be misleading, however, to suggest that logical positivists were blind to this objection or that no response to it was ever made. Although not often cited by apologists, the developments which really killed logical positivism were twofold. Firstly, arguments from Hilary Putnam and William Van Orman Quine respectively raised doubts about the foundational nature of sensory observations and the distinction between contingent truths, which rest on the synthesis of experience, and necessary truths, which rest on logical analysis. These arguments were the foundational intellectual blow against logical positivism. Secondly, cultural shifts during the 6th and 7th decades of the 20th century changed the fashion. Following the totalised extremities of the Second World War and potentially apocalyptic developments in science and technology, attempting to cast the world anew in the light of progress seemed a lot less noble and a lot more dangerous than it had done previously. Subsequently, the new postmodernists found reckless much of what the preceding modernists had found fearless. And so, hard nosed logical positivism was replaced by post positivism. In pretty much the same way as hard nosed serialism in music was replaced by neoclassicism and populism. Hard nosed geometrical reduction in the visual arts by eclecticism and populism, and behaviourism in psychology by cognitivism, and indeed popularism. Though apologists prefer to focus on the inconsistency objection, it's Putnam and Quine's arguments on the changing times which have led most contemporary philosophers to reject logical positivism. Naturalism can be understood as the claim that our best means of knowing about the essential constitution of things as they develop of their own accord are, in addition to being our best means of knowledge in general, rightfully privileged in saying which entities are more basic, durable and independent, and which events, properties, categories and relations are precedent to and necessary for others. Whilst there are forms of atheism, such as my own, which rest on the paucity of good scientific reasons for positing the probable existence of a most basic, durable and independent deity, the link between naturalism and atheism is not, as the apologists imply, a conceptually necessary one. It is possible to be an atheist without being a naturalist. Thus, even if naturalism were false, Atheism could, contrary to the apologist's argument, be true. It is also possible to be a naturalist without being a logical positivist. One can logically hold the natural sciences in the highest epistemic and ontological regard, while simultaneously denying that sensory experience, clarified through the application of logic, is necessary for meaning and knowledge. Naturalists could, and indeed do, accept that observations are too theory-laden to be taken as foundations for knowledge, and that our understanding of formal truths as conceptual truths may, despite their analytic nature, be revised in the light of synthetic empirical findings. Naturalists can also accept the cultural dangers of appeals to untested new orders, or warn without hypocrisy of blind faith in science and technology. Thus, despite the prattling of aggressive negative apologists, naturalism survives the demise of logical positivism. And it can only be their intention to deceive, or their ignorance, which leads such apologists to imply differently. Another problem for those who imply that most, or at least a growing number, of high-level philosophers are orthodox religious believers is a lack of statistical evidence to back up their claims. 
there have in reality only been a few small scale polls that have collected data relevant to this issue. And these flatly contradict the apologists' claim. Take, for example, the Philosophy Papers surveys undertaken online during November 2009 and consisting of 3,226 respondents, of whom 1,803 declared themselves PhDs or faculty and 829 postgraduate students. This poll suggests that 69.7% of philosophy PhDs or faculty and 63.5% of postgraduate philosophy students are or lean towards atheism, with an additional 13.9% of PhD or faculty and an additional 15.5% of postgraduate students expressing views that are not or do not lean towards orthodox theism. Results of this kind, which certainly chime with my personal experience of professional philosophy, cast doubt on any claim that the majority of philosophers are, or are quickly becoming, orthodox religious believers. It's true that after the demise of the logical positivist prohibition on speculative metaphysics, there has been a repackaging in shiny new analytic terms of traditional metaphysical arguments for orthodox religious belief. And whilst these arguments have not proven sufficiently strong to convert many who were not already orthodox believers, uh, they have given believers some elbow room in philosophy of religion which may go some way to explaining why, according to the Philosophy Papers survey, 69.3% of philosophy of religion PhDs or faculty and 76.7% of postgraduate philosophy of religion students are all lean towards theism. The problem for any suggestion that this spells doom for atheism is that philosophers of religion are in a minority. In the Philosophy Papers survey, for example, only 5.6% of PhD or faculty respondents and 1.6% of graduate student respondents declared their area of specialisation to be philosophy of religion. It would, therefore, be a foolish overgeneralisation to talk, as apologists often seem to, of philosophers in general whilst only having philosophers of religion in mind. On figures like these, and though I have looked, there is no data that I know of which contradicts them, it seems as if any claim that the philosophical elite have abandoned or are rapidly abandoning atheism is not to be taken seriously. However, there is an important sense in which these statistics are besides the point. Because even if the majority of philosophers were orthodox theists, it is fallacious to confuse popularity with truth. Even popularity amongst scholarly elites. After all, the majority of one such elite were logical positivists once, until a new generation of arguments and emerging cultural trends changed what they considered to be true. So we've seen that atheism, even when inferred from philosophical naturalism, does not depend on the now defunct logical positivism. And we can understand that the claims of a potentially biased minority are not necessarily true, even when overgeneralized to the majority. Given these findings, the claims of Dr. Craig and others about what follows from the demise of logical positivism can be safely ignored. Thank you for listening. I told you I could do it, didn't I? Uh... <laughs>